couple of years ago, I was in the hospital uh, on my birthday. And yesterday I was trying to remember whether it was three years ago or two years ago, and I think it was two years ago. And it was a pretty good birthday. And I, I spent the day yesterday with some folks that came to visit me during that birthday. And I had people in, in my room from about 12 o'clock on. And I had three or four birthday cakes. <laughs> and I got done there and I thought, well, this is just about the best birthday I ever had. My sister came and visited me. Friends from down the hill came and visited me. It was, and uh, I was not uh, life-threateningly sick. I just uh, couldn't breathe. And, uh, yeah. But it wasn't like the last adventure. It wasn't like that. This was, yeah, Susan's back there laughing. Um, so once I got in there, you know, I, I had, uh, I, I don't know whether I had a touch of the flu or I had, I, th I think I had like an asthma attack and I didn't realize what was happening. And, and, you know, it escalated and the doctor said, okay, we'll put you in the hospital, get you on some oxygen. And that's his main concern. But it was everything but a bad experience, really. Once I got in there and I knew I was being taken care of, that's my response to going to the hospital is I'm being taken care of. You know, I don't fight it at all. I just, okay, it's, I'm as safe as I can get because I'm here. And I know that there's, you know, people talk about the, the problems and, of course, hospitals and lots of disease and all this. But I still, that's my response, okay? I can't get any safer than this. And um, I had a monk that I've known since before he was a monk. Uh, he's in his middle age now. But I always think of him as a kid, and he's Vietnamese, he was, but he was born here. And so he went to study with a friend of mine who's about 10 or 15 years older than me, and he had to learn to speak Vietnamese, which is no small challenge, <laughs> just so he could talk to his teacher. And he came to visit me, and he brought me two little cakes. And the nurse came in, and, and uh, he said to her, and I thought it was so funny. He said to her, and I can't remember why he said this, because I had people going in and out of the room. He said, when he sees a woman, he sees a man. And what he was trying to say was that, you know, I, I wasn't sexually active. That's what he was saying in his own peculiar way, right? Well, he's still a young man. So, and he's celibate. And so he probably deals with a certain amount of attraction to people and things like that. And uh, so that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about today, which we never talk about. Because in America, most of the monks that people encounter are from the Japanese tradition. And in the Japanese tradition, the monks traditionally marry. And that's a whole history lesson in itself we're not going to go into. But that's... Now, the common practice for the last hundred plus years has been that, uh, that they marry. Now, the nuns don't normally marry. That's their choice. I had them tell me that. That was our choice. We decided we didn't want to do that. But uh, the monks have a, they marry and they have a long suffering wife. Think of poor Baptist minister's wife in the middle of the deep south. They have nothing but, uh, but love. <laughs> and, and some kids. And um, so we, we have to wait another hundred years probably to see how this is going to play out in America. But this is what Americans are used to. They're, they're used to Protestant ministers. And so to some of them, this whole notion of celibacy, it just, you know, it's crazy to them, the idea of not having any kind of sexual activity. And that's very Protestant, you know. I mean, what did Luther do? The, the minute he got excommunicated, he married a nun, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, he solved that problem. So I want to tell two stories. And you've all heard the stories or read the stories before, but I want to use them as kind of a focus. And the first thing that I have to explain to you is why monks are celibate. Because in India 2,500 years ago, in India today, if you are going to be a religious seeker, 
if you are going to leave your home, hopefully the ideal is with the permission of your wife, because almost everybody has a family. And, uh, but the idea is that your family would be grown. This is the ideal now, and there's always exceptions. But uh, your, your children are adults now, and they have their own families, and you've been working on the farm or in the shop or whatever it is that you do for a living, and uh, you go to your wife and you say, well, I want to go off and, and do this religious path, and she's supposed to get permission, and you're supposed to set things up so that she's not going to starve to death because you leave. Okay, these are all the ideals, and most of the time it plays out like this. And then we have the going forth, which is the traditionally how becoming a monk was talked about in the Buddhist time, going forth. Leaving home is another description. And so that we have an interesting phenomenon that takes place that I hope that didn't get out of focus because I shifted. <laughs> and so um, we, we have this phenomenon that takes place is that uh, the monk leaves the home and goes off into the forest. Now, they're not monks. They're just religious seekers. They, there's a name for them. It's Shramana, and, uh, which is very close to our name for novices, which is Shramanera or Shramanerika. But Shramana means seeker. So you can see the root of that term. And that leaving home takes place when you're a novice. And it's the most important part of becoming a monk in Buddhism is first cutting off your hair. Why? Because in India 2,500 years ago, that was how your caste was denoted. We knew whether you were a kshatriya, a warrior caste like the historical Buddha was, or you were a Brahmin, or you were a shopkeeper, or you were a farmer. We knew it from your hair. And uh, not, not the little beauty marks that they were but from, from the way you wore your hair. So, of course, later on, artists put the hair back on the Buddha, right? You see all this stuff sometimes uh, showing that he was a great warrior. So you cut off your hair, you cut off your caste, you hopefully had said to your wife, is it okay? Are you gonna be all right? Can I go and do this thing? And, uh, and then you go and you, there's a variety of things you could do. You could go study with a guru, but the most common thing is just to go off in the forest and maybe find a teacher in the forest and wander around in the forest and never take a bath and smell really bad. And, you know, and just get to the point where you don't have to worry about girlfriends because nobody wants to come near you. That's what I always say. I said, I don't think the Buddha had any, any problem with beautiful women because they could smell him a mile away because never taken, and they used to put, they used to put uh, cow dung all over their body. Mm -hmm. I'm not really sure what that was all about, but they did that and they put ash all over their body. And so you can still see that in India uh, today. And that's going forth, that's leaving home, hopefully with the permission of the family. And in Buddhist countries around the world, when someone goes forth, there's a great deal of feeling of pride that this has happened. This is kind of like the Irish Catholic mother who has the Catholic priest son. You know, it's, it's a, a point of pride. Now the Irish Catholic mother is not excited if all her son wants to become priest because she wants grandchildren, but you know, they always try to have one Catholic priest. So kind of like that in Buddhism. The Indian model 2,500 years ago was the ascetic. And the ascetic let go of all attachments. And the Indians felt that what was keeping us from purity, and that's the way they looked at it, because if you could become completely pure, you could reunite with God. Because they had a strong notion of God. Now, it's not the Christian notion of God. The Indians didn't believe in somebody that lived in the sky that parted the clouds and talked to you, but they believed in the notion of a creator God, which was Brahma, and Brahma dreamed. And this is his dream that we live. I, I think that's much more poetic than somebody one day got bored and decided to create life as we know it on earth. Brahma just dreamed. 
And of course the Indians had the notion of cycles, that eventually uh, Brahma will wake up and we're, we're very worried now about global warming and before global warming. I mean, this is, this is a tension producing thing, like we can really honestly do anything about it. it you know, it, it's, it's obvious the climate is changing, but it's obvious the climate's been changing since we started paying attention to the climate. Change is the only constant in the universe. But when I was young, the tension producer was Russia and the atomic bombs, right Chuck? And we never knew. And it, it, at times it really felt like, I remember one time Eisenhower came to talk on the TV and my dad said, we're going to war with Russia. He sat there going, we're going to war with Russia. My dad had built a bomb shelter in the backyard because we knew, well, the Russians were crazy. They were gonna conquer the world with communism. And he was positive, oh, you know, They've sent the, he's, he's gone on TV to tell us that the rocket's coming that's gonna blow up New York. And of course, we're gonna show all the logic of the world, we're gonna blow up Stalingrad or someplace like that, or the Kremlin. So we have this tension. We've always had some kind of tension in our lives about what's gonna happen. And back in, in that time, you walked away from that, whatever that tension was and you went off into the forest because you needed to become pure. Now they've got the idea of karma, that in the past lives they've got the idea of rebirth. And in past lives you perhaps did some things that weren't nice and you carried that karmic imprint on you. And so the way you solved that problem was to be good. Didn't get to go to heaven, but if you were good enough lives, you could reunite with God. Because the Hindu notion, which is the same today, is that everybody is a piece of God. And the only thing that's holding us away from God is our impurity. And our senses, our senses cause the impurities. So I, I look at Susan and I see a pretty girl, which by the way, which is exactly what I see every time I look at Susan. Sometimes she's really pretty and sometimes she looks pretty damn tired, but she's still a pretty girl. Okay, I think of when he came in there and he says, when, he's, when he sees women, he sees men. I never see men when I see women. I see women. <laughs> but the, the difference is, and I didn't get into it with him, but it's a reality, is when you step away from constantly being driven by lust, mm -hmm. okay, because which is viewed by the Indians as an impurity. It's something you can't control, just like you can't control having to eat all the time. Okay, anything that you get addicted to. I look at men and I see pretty men and I see pretty women. And one of my favorite things to look at today, and I've said, you've heard me say it before, is old women. I think old women are some of the most beautiful people in the world. There's no lust in this. It's just, I'm very visually oriented, I'm a guy. And I see them and I think how incredibly beautiful they are. But you know, I was in Josh Tree Monument, which is now a, a federal park, and I, I, I was surrounded by beauty yesterday. I actually got my camera out, took pictures of rocks and dead trees and cactus and all kinds of things, and just overwhelmed by beauty. Same thing. It's exactly the same thing. And that kind of response is pure because there's no attachment to what's going on. And that's what the, the Hindu ascetics were attempting to accomplish. They, they starved themselves because they felt that their attachment to food. Well, we understand with our science and everything that a certain amount of food is necessary. The yogis never starved themselves. The yogis understood healthy body, healthy mind. Healthy mind, healthy body. They understood this, but not everybody in India is a yogi. <laughs> you know, they just... Well, today I'm going to wander off into the forest and starve myself. And then they would do that. And little niceties like going down to the river and washing themselves, they stopped doing that. And they felt all of this was an attachment to these different conditions. And we see, I, I, I like to tell people every morning when I get up, 
and I wash my face and I look in the mirror, I'm surprised. <laughs> you know, who is that? But what I'm really saying is, is I don't worry about it. I can remember 20 years ago giving a talk to a, a, about a thousand Vietnamese people and explaining to them the change that takes place in life. I have got more bumps, I've never counted them, on my face. And it seems like every time I wash my face and I look, I got another bump somewhere. You know, and I, a couple of years ago, I went to a dermatologist because I said, well, I don't know what's going on. And he looks, you know, they're all right. He took a couple of them off. Okay. But this attachment to the way we look, we look just fine. However we look, we look just fine. That's the best we can look there. But there's a story, and I want to tell you the first story, which you've heard many times. And it's a very famous story. Anybody that has the Zen school, the meditation school, the Tian school in their country, they, they know this story because the story is about two monks walking down a road. And if you don't know, monks were walking all the time. Monks in the early days were very much wanderers. Now they, they lived in temples and they lived in monasteries, but there was, there was intense training that took place and at the end of the training period, they'd pack up a little lunch, you know, an extra change of clothes, and they'd wander down the road to go visit another monastery to see their friends. They'd take a break, a vacation. And these two guys were wandering from one town to another, one temple to another, and they came to a stream and there was a beautiful woman standing there, young, wearing a beautiful dress. And she's standing at the edge of this stream, and the older monk says, what you doing? And she says, well, I need to get across the stream because I'm going to this town, but I don't want to get wet. I'll ruin my shoes and I'll ruin my dress. And he said, no problem. I'll carry you across the stream. And he picked her up and he carried her across the stream. And he got to the other side and he put her down and she said, well, thank you so much. And of course, she knew that monks were not supposed to touch. See, this is a difficulty that Americans have. You're not supposed to touch a monk. It's a 2,500-year-old rule. And I always laugh about that because we need to be careful. When the Vietnamese come to visit us, you don't get to touch me. And I have so many people that come here, they'll say, now the Vietnamese are going to watch this and I'm going to hear about it. They'll say, can I give you a hug? I don't see any Vietnamese. And I'm a hugger. That's my natural, that's my natural state. I'm a toucher and I'm a hugger. And I have to be careful about both of those things. And I'll go, sure. So, <laughs> if you watch Japanese movies, which I used to be addicted to, samurai movies, you find out in Japanese culture, because they are so repressed, I had two psychology courses. I learned that, that term in one of them. They are so repressed that in the movies, if, either one of the a couple touches each other, then everything goes blank and music plays. You know what that means. Everything goes dark and the music goes because they go completely crazy. They can't control themselves because they actually touch each other because in Japan, they never touch each other. You know, they don't shake hands, right? You just bow. And so I always laugh because that's part of the idea behind it that is, Touching will lead, and it will under certain circumstances, touching will lead to more touching, which will lead to whatever. And so I think about that, that pretty girl that got carried across the stream and what was going through her mind, that here's this monk, who was probably smelly, carried her across the stream and put her down and said, there you go. And they walked on. And as they were coming up on the temple, which was miles down the road, the younger monk said to the older monk, he said, okay, I can't take it anymore. We're not supposed to touch women. You just touched a woman. You picked a woman up. You carried her for a while. I don't understand. One of our basic rules is not to touch women. And the monk said, I put her back, I put her down, back at the stream. And you've carried her all this way? What do you think? And of course, he was saying, who has the problem? 
and the young monk had the problem. And that story is told over and over and over again. It is not about touching. It is about what you carry in your mind. Because your mind creates all your reality. And my second story that I love, and it took me a very long time to understand this story, because it's a koan, it's a Zen story, and you're supposed to solve it, is a story of a lady, she's elderly, and she provides for a monk. Now this is a great thing. You know, in the Orient, if you can support a monk, and that may mean that you go to the temple once a monk, once a monk, once a month, and you give a little envelope to the monk so he can buy medicine or uh, Hershey's Kisses or whatever he does with his little bit of money. Somebody bought me some Hershey's Kisses. Oh, yeah, that one did too. <laughs> and so that's supporting a monk. And this lady, she had a little hut that she had built, and this kind of hermit lived in this hut. And uh, every day she would take him a meal. He only ate one meal a day. And so she had a daughter, and the daughter came to visit. And she said to the daughter, the daughter said, well, how's that monk doing down there? He's been down there for years now. And the mother said, you know, I'm not really sure how the monk is doing. Why don't you go down and check him out? See if he's really a holy man. Because that's the notion we have, you know, that people that are, that are hermits and recluses and people that live in monasteries, that they're holy. And she said, uh, and, the, and the mother gave her some instructions. So the girl went down there and she knocked on the door and the monk said, come on in. And she came on in and she was very pretty. And she had worked herself up and she told the monk, she explained to him that she was, oh, she was lonely and nobody loved her. And she had a boyfriend, but he left her. And she just said, just think drama, think modern drama. She went through this whole business with this monk. And the monk's sitting there looking very monkish. And he says, oh, I can't help you. I, I, I'm just an old bag of dried bones and twigs. And so the, the daughter said, oh, okay. And she left. Now she brought him his lunch. She went back to her mom. And her mom said, so did you tell him that you, you know, you needed, you needed some comfort, that you were lonely and unhappy? And he said, yeah, I did all that. What did he say? He said, well, he couldn't do me any good. So the mother got a big long stick and went down and beat on that monk and ran him off and burned that hut to the ground. And so what is the point of this story? Well, that monk was so deluded, he didn't understand that he could pick her up and carry her a little ways. But he didn't have to carry her in any bad way, that he could give her comfort, that he could hold her. And it didn't have to go any further than that. And that's a great misunderstanding. And uh, I know a lady that we all know very well, Marilyn, and she's teaching second grade right now and she says those second graders every day when they leave they line up to give her a hug they will not leave the classroom unless they give her a hug and this is california and in california back when i got my teaching credential i was told i took a class and the professor said do you know what you do if you're teaching elementary school and a child falls down in the yard and scuffs up their knees and their elbows and they're bleeding, they come in crying? He says, you know what the first thing you do is? <coughs> and, and, and people said things like, well, you give them, you know, you give them first aid. That, that was a common thing. You give them first aid. And some people said, well, you, you give them a hug. And he says, you put your hands in your pocket. Because you don't want to give any appearance that something's wrong. So basically, don't ever comfort a child. And so this lady that we all know, <laughs> she told me a couple days ago, she said, those kids, they will not leave at the end of the day unless every one of them comes up and gives her a hug. That's humanity. That monk had lost his way. And he sat in that hut, bitter, 
and lost his humanity. And that's why she ran him off with a stick and burned the hut to the ground. And the monk who carried the, the girl across the stream never lost sight of the fact that he was a human being and he needed to take care of other human beings.